is Debbie Giorgiani. Thank you for listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. We have an unprotected class of persons in our nation being murdered by the thousands every day. Every human being is a human person, and the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says there is to be equal protection for all persons. How does this square? It doesn't. We have a constitutional crisis before us. The U.S. Supreme Court has to answer this question, and we're going to break down some of the receipts that we have on the proof of the personhood of the child in the womb Today on The Simple Truth, I'm Jim Havens, and it's Friday with Father. That's Father Stephen Imbarato, our co-host every Friday. And uh, we are providing cutting-edge pro-life commentary you're not going to hear anywhere else. We consecrate everything to the sacred heart of Jesus through the immaculate heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. Always great to be with you, Father. How are you? And will you lead us in an opening prayer? Yes, I'm doing well. Let's pray. Name it, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, name your Son, our Lord Christ. We ask the Holy Spirit down upon us, Lord. Do we thank you for this opportunity to come together in your name, please? Uh, may your truth be on our tongue, on our lips, that your truth may be proclaimed. Open up the hearts and minds of those who hear us and see us, that your truth may be heard. And on your truth being proclaimed and heard, Lord, may your truth be lived that in some small way in this hour and going forward we may bring souls to salvation uh, and bring us uh, the, uh, an end to the scourge of abortion in our cities, our state, our country, and our culture. And we ask this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, all the angels, martyrs, and saints, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Very good. Thank you, Father. And uh, again, today's topic, proof of personhood. We've got the receipts. This is part two of a show we did a couple of weeks ago. We are going through the Josh Craddock Harvard paper, protecting prenatal persons. Does the 14th Amendment prohibit abortion? The answer is, is that it does, that abortion is unconstitutional. Now, Josh Craddock put this forward in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy back in 2017. And when he did so, he was just a law student there at the time at uh, Harvard University Law School. He went on to uh, become a, um, a, part, uh, a member of the uh, James Wilson Institute for Natural Rights and the American Founding. He's a, a lawyer, and he continues to advocate for the personhood of the preborn under the 14th Amendment. And certainly there are many that came before him making this argument, Hadley Arcus, um, Charles, Charles Rice, many others. Um, and then there are also um, those that continue to, to move it forward as well. We talk about the amicus brief to Dobbs quite often here with Robert George and John Finnis, um, great scholars, um, I believe uh, Princeton and, uh, and Oxford, respectively, if I have that right. But uh, the, the legal scholarship, the historical scholarship here is incredible. It really needs to be brought down, though, to the grassroots level. It needs to change our hearts and minds. We need to understand these arguments and we need to be able to have um, some some uh, some grip of this, which doesn't take too much to really have a little bit of a solid grip on all this so that we can understand what is going on and what we need to do to help change the hearts and minds of others to get to an end of this thing because it is unconstitutional it currently under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So we're going to get drilled down on this a little bit more. Um, we, uh, we got pretty far in that first episode episode, but there's a whole lot more to go. And I think some of what uh, we have to tell you today, some of the details, the historic and legal details here are really, they're going to they're gonna blow you away. They're things that you've never heard before. Uh, Father, anything else you want to share by way of introduction? Well, I just think that, you know, we, we uh, talk about the 14th Amendment all the time. So let me just uh, throw in there for those who might be listening for the first time, this is the section of the 14th Amendment that we are talking about. It's just a couple of lines. It's very short, but it says, Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. All right, those are the three inalienable rights. 
given to us by our Creator, without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So this inalienable right to life endowed by our Creator guarantees us due process that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness cannot be taken from us without due process, all right, nor, all right, or uh, we also are guaranteed equal protection under the law, every person. So what we're talking about here, the simple question is that uh, Jim and I and those who are listening, those who are watching, anyone, including the pre-born, who have, of course, very some very obvious rights in certain circumstances, uh, but are denied rights in, in the area of abortion, when do we obtain that right? When do we obtain that inalienable right to life that guarantees us due process and equal protection of the law? And that's the simple question that we want the Supreme Court to answer. That's the crux of all of this. And uh, as we pointed out last week, right, in terms of Florida, for instance, and all the other referendums that are going on in the country, including the seven referendums that we have lost, um, these referendums are all unconstitutional because what they do is establish uh, abortion on demand or some level of abortion, which denies the pre-born as persons the right to life uh, uh, and and deny them equal protection under the law and surely do not allow them any due process. So that's the crux of what we're talking about, and this is what Josh's treatise uh, basically is all about. Yep. Yeah. And, and a quick recap from part one, just to catch you up if you missed it or if you maybe have forgotten a few things just real quick. Uh, so Craddock states at the beginning, he says this paper argues that preborn human beings are legal persons within the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. We talked about Roe v. Wade last time and then also Justice Scalia's state's rights view, which uh, Craddock um, categorized as uh, being um, that abortion should simply be put to a Democratic vote. Um, he said that this is worrisomely reminiscent of Senator Stephen Douglas's advocacy of popular sovereignty to, de to determine when, whether states could permit racial slavery in the antebellum period, so pre-Civil War period. Uh, we went on to talk about interpreting persons in the 14th Amendment. What was the meaning of the words at the time that the 14th Amendment was written and ratified? And uh, th this is a, a major point. It says that it is reasonable to construe the 14th Amendment to include prenatal life. The structure of the argument is simple. The 14th Amendment's use of the word person guarantees due process and equal protection to all members of the human species. The preborn are members of the human species from the moment of fertilization. Therefore, the 14th Amendment protects the preborn. So the minor premise here is that the pre that preborn humans are members of the human species. That's a fact. Um, and then the, the major premise here is that the term person in its original public meaning at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption applied to all members of the human species. So that's it. That's the argument in a nutshell. Did the term person at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption apply to all members of the human species? When you look at it, you find out that is absolutely true. And are children in the womb members of the human species? Absolutely. So it applies to them. It's really that simple. Um, now, there's also um, something here about whether states historically believed that the preborn specifically were members of the human species, um, but it, it, this is not dispositive, as Craddock says, um, although I think the argument, um, as you look through the facts on it, I think his, the historical argument is strong that they were believed to be members of the human species. Um, there was some scientific um, uh, development th that occurred in all of that that we have to kind of wade through but um, but certainly as long as they would be there and alive and existing that people would say that um, that they would be members of the human species but the argument here doesn't even hinge on that and, and here's why because just as freedom of speech protects movies and internet communication under an originalist interpretation even though those technologies did not exist at the time of the first amendment's adoption 
person protects every member of the human species, regardless of whether individuals were recognized as members of the human family at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption or not. And so he's going to go on to defend this major premise in three ways. Textual analysis, looking at dictionaries and common legal usage, also common law precedent and inferences from state practice, and the anticipated legal application of the amendment to the extent that expected application is indicative of public meaning. So it's a bit wordy there and and some legalese, but we're going to break it down for you and give you the facts on this. And what we're going to find in in, in a basic summary here what we're going to find is that this is it, it starts to paint a picture that nobody in their right mind at the time of the 14th amendment thought about murdering children in the womb and and stripping them of their rights and doing what we're doing today that was unthinkable at the time and so it was a very different mindset that was in the culture than what we have today and then from the mindset that we have today where the child in the womb has been so dehumanized very different from what it was back then People can't see it the other way around. And so which one is right is a question. But I think the absolute fact of the matter is the science shows that life begins in the womb at conception fertilization and every human being is a human person. And therefore, the child in the womb is a person under the 14th Amendment with a constitutional right to life. And beyond all this, taking a step back, even if there were no constitution, Right, Even if there were no declaration of independence, that child in the womb has a God-given right to life. And that's what the, the founders got right. That's what they put in the declaration. That's what the 14th Amendment really flows from. And so um, this all goes back to just a common sense understanding of reality. Of course, every person has a right to life. We can't just be killing innocent people because we feel like it or we say they're not equal to us because of this reason or that reason. Of course, that is evil. Of course, that is wrong. We're going to get Father's uh, commentary on all this as we go, of course, as well, and get as many of the facts out to you today as we can so we can know them and share them. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On February 16th, we celebrate the feast of Saint Onesimus, bishop and martyr. Onesimus, whose name means useful in Greek, was a native of Phrygia and a slave to Philemon of Colossae, a wealthy Christian convert and future martyr. Onesimus robbed his master and fled from Colossae to Rome, but in that great city, Providence ensured that Onesimus met Saint Paul, who quickly converted and baptized the runaway slave. In his epistle to St. Philemon, Paul mentions that he is sending Onesimus back to his master, for as a Christian, Onesimus was now bound to return Philemon's stolen property. Though St. Paul did not explicitly recommend that Philemon legally free Onesimus, Philemon must have done so, for tradition relates that Onesimus eventually became a bishop. The traditional Roman martyrology agrees with the Greeks that Onesimus succeeded St. Timothy as bishop of Ephesus, and is thus the same bishop Onesimus commended by St. Ignatius in his letter to the Ephesians. According to this tradition, Onesimus was taken captive to Rome, and there stoned and possibly beheaded, in the late 1st or early 2nd century. The Greeks commemorate St. Onesimus on February 15th. Also honored on this day are St. Juliana of Nicomedia, a great patroness against illness, St. Julian of Egypt and his companions, Our Lady of the Thorns, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network is dedicated to answering the critical need of access to quality, consistent, professional, and proven Catholic programming. We cannot rely on other media outlets to properly represent our church. Catholic Radio reaches Catholics, non-Catholic Christians, and non-believers alike. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent of your diocese, our apostolate is listener-supported. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Stephen Imbarato. We are talking about proof of personhood. That is personhood for all children in the womb from conception, fertilization. And uh, this is something that is given 
by God, but also given by the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution under the 14th Amendment explicitly, and even under the 5th Amendment, it's there as well, and uh, we see those facts laid out in this Craddock paper we're going through as well as we continue to move on through it. But Father, what else do you want to uh, say off the top here? Well, I just want, you know, you brought up uh, the the whole, uh, really, without mentioning Catholic teaching, Catholic teaching. So just as I I quoted the uh, 14th Amendment, let's, let's quote the Catechism of the Catholic Church 2270, who actually, the question that I presented to the Supreme Court, right, when do we obtain these inalienable rights endowed by our Creator? Catechism 2270 answers this, right? Human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. Now, Josh always says uh, that the the history in the United States, the history in in uh, uh, juridical law was always that as soon as life is detected, life is protected, right? So, of course, we know scientifically, and of course, the Catholic Church reiterates that, all right, that it's from the moment of conception, from the first moment of his existence, A human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. So, you know, I I have a video on rallyforpersonhood.com where I lay that out, especially for Catholics. This is a Catholic program. We may have some non-Catholics listening or watching, but this is a Catholic program. So as Catholics, We have two obligations here to stand on constitutional person from the moment of conception. The constitutional obligation as Americans and then our moral obligations as Catholics to adhere to 2270. So um, those are pretty, pretty, you know, heavy uh, – obligations on our part right to stand up for the pre-born and to be activists in this in this particular regard right so uh, this is the reason why uh, you and I Jim are are doing these programs right every single week now it's about personhood 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 uh, it seems as if the mainstream corporate pro-life movement has become irrelevant because they chose to hang their hat on 15 week bans and all kinds of compromises and exceptions, right? Uh, so now we need to uh, pick up the mantle, and the mantle is this. The, the solution to abolishing abortion in this country is constitutional person from the moment of conception. We have a constitutional obligation. We have a moral obligation. We as Catholics need to take the light, the lead, the forefront, and that's what rallyforpersonhood.com is all about. It gives us the tools that are necessary to get to the point where you, where Jim and I already are, you might be saying, "Well, Father, you're a Catholic priest, and you know, and 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 Jim's a Catholic father and husband. Uh, you know, you guys aren't lawyers. Well, it doesn't matter, all right? The fact of the matter is, all right, we have a moral and constitutional obligation, and we've been pro-life activists, uh, anti-abortion activists, and so we're 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 getting the word out there against." You know, against the majority, the overwhelming majority of the people in the pro-life leadership are not on board with this. And we need to overcome their voices, uh, their influence, and get the word out and try and get the Supreme Court, uh, demand the Supreme Court uh, recognize constitutional person from the moment of conception and abolish abortion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there are uh, there are lawyers in the body of Christ, and then there are uh, communicators as well who are taking right what those lawyers have done, and now we are trying to share it in a more common sense, down to earth way um, to help um, help everybody to understand it better, to really uh, make it their own, and be able to speak on it. That's what we're trying to do today, and so we're kind of like uh, translators in, in this sense, you know, trying to take this legal language and then bring it down into a more uh, more grassroots format. And so, not that I, I think people are pretty 
smart. They could read through this paper themselves and pull out these facts themselves. But uh, we're trying to do a service and help out a little bit here. So that's what we're up to. But yes, we all need to be pushing forward for the end of this ongoing daily mass murder of our littlest brothers and sisters. And the fact is, is that the way to do that, the way to push forward on this right now, post Dobbs, is to be standing, to be proclaiming, to be calling for the affirmation of constitutional personhood for the for the child in the womb, for all children in the womb. And the fact is, is we don't need a new U.S. Uh, constitutional amendment on this. We just need leaders to apply what's already there in the 14th Amendment, the U.S. Supreme Court, but all legislators can act on this. The executive branch can act on this. Any person in government can act on this. And people in, in any position in church and state from the lowest to the highest level can advocate for this. And that's what we're called to do. And it's time to do it now. So let's get to some facts to help us to be armed with more of these facts so that uh, when people c- try to question us or, or for if we if we need to be more convicted ourselves on it, well, let, let's consult the, the, the facts of the matter. And I think that's going to convict us more and help us to share it a whole lot better. So in this Craddock paper, when he goes through the text and dictionary usage here, he says that according to, according to dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption, the term person was largely interchangeable with human being or man. In legal usage, the term person had expansive scope. It wasn't limited. It was expansive to all human beings. The principle of Blackstone's rule, we talked about Blackstone last time, was that where life can be shown to exist, legal personhood exists. And so textual analysis and examination of dictionary usage support the conclusion that the 14th Amendment protects preborn humans. And that's where we left off from last time. So now getting into this next section on common law precedent and state practice, listen to this. The historic recognition of the preborn as persons, it's not necessary to prove that they are included within the meaning of that that term in the 14th Amendment, as we were saying uh, in the first segment. But nevertheless, the development of the common law and state practices related to abortion leading up to 1868, which was the year the 14th Amendment um, was uh, ratified, these common law and state practices shed light on the meaning of person at that time. So by the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption, nearly every state had criminal legislation proscribing abortion, prescribing this legal term meaning to condemn or forbid as harmful or unlawful. And most of these statutes were classified among offenses against the person. The original public meaning of the term person thus incontestably included prenatal life. Indeed, there can be no doubt whatsoever that the word person referred to the fetus. In 23 states and six territories, laws referred to the preborn individual as a child. Is it reasonable to presume that these legislatures would have used this terminology if they had not considered the fetus to be a person? And fetus, by the way, Latin meaning little one. That's what that means. And in the footnote here, it says that this terminology is striking compared to that of today's advocates for legal abortion who prefer to use the term fetus rather than child. Back then, what they were using in the legislatures was the term child, was the term person. They weren't using the term fetus back then. A very different time where they saw this much more clearly than we see it today, and that really is the problem. Father, your thoughts. Well, only, Jim, that, you know, it's it's important for all of us to understand, you know, that until Roe versus Wade uh, brought a federalized permission to have abortion, not a constitutional right to have abortion, but uh, a, a federal permission to have abortion up to the day of birth, this this was unheard of. This was unheard of. And even when uh, Roe versus Wade was adjudicated, uh, this became almost a national shock. You know, we, we talk about the fact that we are trying to create this demand, right, this national debate and demand 
over uh, to get the Supreme Court to recognize person from the moment of conception. But in 1973, there was not a national debate as to whether abortion should be legal. It was coming to the fore, but it wasn't an all-consuming debate. There surely were a lot of other things going on, the Vietnam War and uh, the sexual revolution. Of course, Jim, you know, we've discussed that in other shows. Uh, but uh, indeed, prior to Roe versus Wade, all right, this this was not. Uh, you know, abortion up to the day of birth was, was was something that was foreign to everyone. And I'm not even sure the Supreme Court um, uh, realized that in Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton that they were actually allowing for abortion up uh, to the day of birth, abortion on demand for any reason. Uh, and so I, I really think that people need to understand that, that the the history of abortion in this country, uh, considering the, what, 200 and almost 50 years now of our, our, of our nation, uh, is quite recent. It's quite recent. The history really is, uh, you know, uh, human protection from the moment of conception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this uh, next part uh, really lays that out in, in quite uh, quite clear ways. And so, uh, yeah, going through the science here, saying that in the 18th century, Koch's description, quick with child, the point at which the child is first able to move, then considered to be the beginning of existence, was equated with quickening, the point at which the mother first feels fetal movement. This distinction was intended to protect prenatal life as soon as it could be discerned, not to exclude human life from, from protection prior to that point. But this quickening distinction survived in common law until emergent medical science discovered that human life began at fertilization, allowing medical examiners to prove prenatal life and cause of death due to abortion with greater certainty. After this discovery in the early 19th century, British courts instructed jurors that quick with child which had earlier meant formed and animated now meant from the moment of conception when determining whether to grant temporary reprieve from execution for a pregnant woman for example the court in Regina v. Weikerly reinterpreted common law to reflect the new scientific fact in 1838 this revision of the common law to conform to this basic principle that human life where it exists must be protected informed the meaning of the term person in the united states at the time of the 14th amendment's adoption thomas percival's influential and widely circulated 19th century work medical ethics declared quote to extinguish the first spark of life is a crime of the same nature both against our maker and society as to destroy an infant a child or a man end of quote the american medical association's 1859 report on abortion considered the human being in utero a person and it called for protection of the quote independent and actual existence of the child before birth as a living being end of quote The Medical Society of New York in 1867, quote, condemned abortion at every stage of gestation as murder, end of quote. In the mid-19th century, American courts began to discard the obsolete quickening rule in order to protect the unborn from the point of fertilization. So it's indicative of the national mood regarding abortion in that era. Meanwhile, state legislatures also took action to prohibit abortion from the point of fertilization. At the end of 1849, no fewer than 18 of the 30 states had enacted anti-abortion statutes. By the end of 1864, 27 of the 36. By the end of 1868, 30 out of 37. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. Abortion industry operatives who deny abortion pill reversal are apparently confused about the effect of a simple hormone, progesterone, on chemical abortions. The Dallas-based American College of OBGYNs is now admitting progesterone in birth control shots interferes with chemical abortion. Except for the case being before the U.S. Supreme Court, it sounds like an unbelievably incredible story. Filed against a vast number of federal departments, the case claims federal pressure on social media giants turned them into censorship agents opposing particular viewpoints, like the life issue. Another pro-life group, the ACLJ, says those actions both violate the First Amendment and jeopardize the fundamental aspect of American life. 
This is Life News Radio. The view, the accurate view of the human person changes everything. The news you hear and see pertaining to the human person has the power to inform or misinform your opinions and what you do with the gift of life and what you allow your government to do. It's why we at this station offer news on the life issue. We hope you carefully assess what you hear, read, and view. Ireland's abortion rate is skyrocketing with last year seeing over 10,000 abortions. With similar population but decades of abortion practice, Minnesota saw roughly 12,000 abortions last year. National Right to Life's Dave Andrusco says a major fact checker is admitting that abortion laws in Texas do not allow for prosecution of mothers. Andrusco says abortion laws across the U.S. target abortion providers. And the first child was spared abortion on the first day of this spring's 40 Days for Life. Find a location near you at 40daysforlife.com. For pro-life headlines, delivered to your email address daily. Sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Stephen Imbarato going through the Craddock paper on constitutional personhood for the pre-born today. Very important content that we are putting out there today. Very important facts that we are laying out. Father, as we go through those last set of facts at the end of the second segment there, um, you know, it strikes me that w- one of the things that is very important to keep in mind with this argument is that in 1868, the year that the 14th Amendment was adopted, again, it was unthinkable for the framers of the 14th Amendment to think that a uh, hundred years later, the culture is going to be such that people are going to be looking to mass murder children in the womb and, and, to, and to treat them as non-human, to, to treat them as things that we can discard just because we feel like it. That was an unthinkable view in 1868. They were expanding, uh, the, the, tr- trying to, to, to afford the rights under the 14th Amendment to, of the Constitution to all persons. That's why they're not saying specifically um, just black persons, which was the main reason behind the 14th Amendment um, because of the, the the horrible injustices that had been committed with slavery and with various acts of racism at the time. And so they were trying to root that out, but they didn't just say black persons. They said all persons. And at the time, persons would have certainly meant the child in the womb to anybody living in that period based on the facts we laid out and more that we're going to share that they just wouldn't have thought that we were going to go down the road that we've gone down, or maybe they would have explicitly said, and by the way, this means the child in the womb, you can't murder them. Um, but clearly that is what they were saying. And, but then here we are over a hundred years later, but people want to just twist it to be able to do what they want to do and they want to kill babies. So they're just going to reinterpret it the way they want to reinterpret it instead of looking back at the historical facts of what was actually going on, Father. Yeah, including the Supreme Court, right? I mean, when you think about, you know, Josh laying out the case that as early as 1868, the same year as the 14th Amendment, right? 30 states, I think you said, uh, had uh, protection from fertilization in their in, in, in those states. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty much common common acceptance now that Roe versus Wade was one of the the, the worst. Uh, judicial decisions in the history of American jurisprudence, right? And uh, and Alito in was was commended in his uh, opinion overturning Roe versus Wade with Dobbs. The research, the history that he went through, right? How in depth he went, uh, but obviously didn't scratch the surface, and because if he did. Uh, And again, I believe that Alito, I believe that every Supreme Court justice knows. I believe that the Supreme Court, every justice knew back when they adjudicated Roe versus Wade that human life begins at conception. They ignored it. They lied actually about it, saying we don't need to know when uh, human life begins uh, to uh, to adjudicate this. Uh, But they lied. They knew when human human life began because, of course, uh, uh, you know, a century before they knew, right? And so, you know, what, what we have here now 
is Josh laying out the the in very simple terms for everyone to understand the blatant truth that's being ignored. And that's why, you know, I say that even today with the overturning of Roe versus Wade with the Dobbs decision, the blood of every baby murdered today in the United States is on the hands of this Supreme Court, right? Because this is so obvious. This is so clear. The history is so deep. Right. Uh, that there's there's no escaping this. And I'm I, for one, am, am not all right, uh, going to shy away from saying exactly that in terms of demanding that the Supreme Court recognized person from the moment of conception, remind them uh, that they are ignoring right the the judicial history in the united states ignoring science uh, ignoring the founding fathers uh, ignoring the constitution most of them are catholics ignoring catholic teaching right i mean this is this is uh uh you know significant stuff i mean this is the stuff that eternal conscience is made out of uh you know comes about from um so i i think that you know this is not something where where you know jim reading josh aware on this show putting out a case right a case to protect the pre-born from the moment of conception no what we're putting out there is the blatant reality that no one can deny and yet even so many on our side are denying it refusing to face up to it and how is that not immoral right we can't let them get away with it whether it's a supreme court justice whether it's uh, a pro-life uh, f- folks in pro-life leadership, whether it's folks, uh, bishops, wh- whoever it is that, that isn't fulfilling their responsibility with respect to these facts, uh, we can't let them get away with it. And what I mean by that is we have to fulfill our responsibility regardless of what they do. So they, if everybody in the world punts, so what? We got to take the ball and run forward. Let's go. That's what we're trying to do with the National Men's March to Abolish Abortion Rally for Personhood, the mensmarch.com, rally for personhood, rally for personhood.com. Come join us at the next March and Rally in Temecula, California, coming up in the first weekend of March. Bishop Strickland will be with us and many more will be there and many other uh, great folks gathering together for this cause. It'd be great to have you with us there. Again, all the details at themensmarch.com. But continue to, to pray and work to press forward on this. But for this to be at the core of our understanding of what needs to be done right now. So again, as Craddock's laying out in this paper, Father, you mentioned it uh, again, that 30 out of 37 states, so there were only 37 states in the union at that time, 30 of them in 1868, the state legislators had prohibited abortion from the point of fertilization, in addition to six territories as well. And so it's clear that there was a general consensus treating preborn human beings as persons at the time that the 14th Amendment was adopted. If that's not a slam dunk fact, I don't know what is. It continues to say these statutes indicate that the preborn were included within the public meaning of the term person at the time of, that the 14th Men- Amendment was adopted. When the amendment was adopted in 1868, the states widely recognized children in utero in the womb as persons. 23 states and six territories referred to the fetus as a, quote, child in their statutes prescribing abortion. At least 28 jurisdictions labeled abortion as a, quote, offense against the person, end of quote, or an equivalent criminal classification. Ten states, nine of which had ratified the 14th Amendment, considered abortion to be either manslaughter slaughter, assault with intent to murder, or murder. New York joined them in 1869, and the number grew to 17 jurisdictions in the period shortly after the adoption of the 14th Amendment. That some states treated abortion as manslaughter rather than murder does not indicate that the unborn child had less value or lacked personhood. Rather, it suggests that the perpetrator was less culpable in some way that's how they viewed it or that the policy reasons dictated a lesser punishment in their view quite simply these statutes were enacted in recognition of unborn human beings full and equal membership in the human family 
That is clear. And several states also left clear documentary evidence about their legislative purposes, which shed light on how lawmakers viewed the relationship between these statutes and the 14th Amendment. For example, after ratifying the 14th Amendment in January uh, 1867, the Ohio legislator, legislature took up a bill to amend their 1834 anti-abortion statute. The committee reviewed the bill. Uh, it, it was composed of several senators that had voted for ratification of the amendment, so same people, and their Senate report elucidated the purposes of the statute observing, quote, the alarming and increasing frequency of abortion by a class of quacks who make child murder a trade, end of quote, pointing out that, quote, physicians have now arrived at the unanimous opinion that the fetus in utero is alive from the very moment of conception, end of quote, the committee repudiated the, quote, ridiculous distinction in the punishment of abortion before and after quickening. They asserted that no opinion could be more erroneous than to think that, quote, to destroy the embryo before that period of quickening is not child murder, end of quote. They concluded their report as follows, quote, let it be proclaimed to the world and let it be impressed upon the conscience of every woman in the land that the, that the willful killing of a human being at any stage of its existence is murder. End of quote. The bill passed both houses of the Ohio legislature by April 1867. And I will correct myself a little bit. I said earlier 1868 was the ratification. That's when it was fully adopted, the 14th Amendment. I guess ratification would have been an earlier part of the process. Anyway, Father, your thoughts. Yeah, so you talk about Ohio and 150 years later, they allow the people of Ohio to vote. Right to vote, all right. Uh, 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 whether another class of persons, right, the pre-born, can be murdered or not, and and so this is this is what's it's this is this is where we've gone, right? In 150 years, we are allowing a group of persons to vote, and it's, we're getting around to just about every state now. Seven have already allowed this. Eight more states are considering it, allowing a group of persons in the state to vote on whether they can mass murder, deny the rights of another class of persons, right, the pre-born from the moment of conception, and mass murder them. I mean, we can talk about the history of the United States and have constitutionally excluded classes as the slaves were for years. Um uh, but now, for the first time in our history, we are not only denying the rights of preborn persons, uh, excluding them constitutionally, but we're mass murdering them, right? And this is, you know, again, it goes back to what I said. I mean, if I was a member of the Supreme Court, I, I'd be telling my fellow uh, 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 uh judges that how, how can we sleep at night how can we live with this this is we we know the truth we know the truth and they're denying the truth and uh, this is this is where we're at so if you have the mainstream corporate pro-life movement who really are the ones who said yes we are going to um, lead the charge to end abortion. You have the mainstream corporate pro-life movement ignoring this. You have the bishops of the United States ignoring 2270 in the catechism. You have the Republican Party that was founded on Lincoln, founded on abolition, ignoring this, right? Uh, no doubt, then, we have people voting state by state by state to mass murder a constitutionally excluded class, right? Uh, you know, folks, those who are listening, watching, uh, whether it's live now or uh, on uh, social media afterwards, you know, it really is time. At rallyforpersonhood.com, well, first of all, you know, Jim mentioned it, all right? We're going to Temecula, California. We've been in the belly of the beast before, Albany, New York, Boston, but now we found a bigger beast a wilder beast we're going to california southern california march 2nd the mar the men's march.com the men's march.com we need people out there uh this is what it's all about and you are going to see a very small group of people all right uh standing up for the pre-born uh, because we're mass murdering them 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, the mensmarch.com, rallyforpersonhood.com. And one thing that strikes me in, um, in, in just sharing some of what we just shared on here is that um, so the Ohio legislature um, putting into their text there very clearly into their legislation um, using using the word child murder to explain what is actually going on um, when we're talking about abortion. And um, when we're thinking about how they had it right in their view and a right perspective and how we have it so wrong in our time, I think there's a clue here, right? We've got to get reality right. And if we're just saying abortion, 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 some people don't even want to say the word abortion. They just want to say termination, or women's health care. They want to hide it even more. But even the word abortion hides the reality so much. Why can't we lovingly say child murder? That's what it is. And even for women and men who have participated in child murder, um, it is loving to, to be able to speak about it frankly because they need to come to grips with what they've done. We don't say it out of a condemnation of them. We just say it as a matter of fact, this is what it is. It's murdering a child. And it is something that anybody who has anything to do with participating in needs to repent of, but we all need to repent of what we haven't done to stop it. We'll be right back, stay tuned. Some atheistic scientists claim we don't need God to explain the universe because science is sufficient to get the job done. But is this true? The answer is no, and here's the reason. Science could never negate the need for God because it can't give an exhaustive explanation of the universe. First, it relies on the inductive method in order to validate its hypotheses. As such, scientists can never be certain they've discovered every piece of data necessary to give a complete explanation. They must always be open to discovering something new that could alter their current theory. Furthermore, Science presupposes an existing universe to observe and explain. Thus, it could never explain why the universe exists in the first place rather than not. Science has explanatory power, but not enough power to negate the need for God. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. What you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily, and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that, and through your programs, I was able to find out how other Protestants have come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the station on the cross. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. Did you know that an unborn child begins to form fingerprints at 10 weeks of development? This feature is fully formed by the 17th week of pregnancy. Just like the unborn child's precious soul, the baby's fingerprints are unique and unrepeatable. Human life is sacred. Think about it. Coalitionforlife.com Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Father Stephen Imbarato going through the Craddock Paper final segment. If you missed anything of this show, go back and listen or watch the rest. Important show. We're laying out some important facts here today about the constitutional personhood of the preborn, the child in the womb, our littlest brothers and sisters who are being murdered by the thousands every day in the U.S. In terms of loss of life, it's a 9-11 every day. Do we act like it? I don't think so. And in terms of loss of life all around the world, we're talking hundreds of thousands, about 200,000 every single day worldwide. Are we acting like it? This is the reality. Craddock lays out in the, uh, towards, um, as he gets towards the end of the paper here about anticipated legal application of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and we had just uh, gone through the fact that uh, at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption, nearly every state understood person to include prenatal life. Um, but the framers also uh, expected the, pr- the 14th Amendment to protect every member of the human species. The amendment was carefully worded to, quote, bring within the aegis of due process and equal protection clauses every member of the human race, regardless of age, imperfection, or condition of unwantedness, end of quote, 
The drafters of the 14th Amendment certainly had the issue of race foremost in mind, but it would be erroneous to believe that the guarantees of due process and equal protection were limited exclusively to black Americans. The 14th Amendment was drafted to create a constitutional remedy for the protecting of the rights of persons when the states failed to do so. For this reason, they chose to use the term person rather than blacks as the object of protection in the text of the Constitution. Senator Jacob Howard, who sponsored the amendment in the Senate declared the amendment's purpose to, quote, disable a state from depriving not merely a citizen of the United States, but any person, whoever he may be, of life, liberty, and property without due process, end of quote. Even the lowest and, quote, most despised of the human race, end of quote, were guaranteed equal protection. Howard went on to say that the amendment, quote, abolishes all class legislation in the states and does away with the injustice of subjecting one class of persons to a code not applicable to another, end of quote. So extending this reasoning to the matter at hand, Legalization of abortion subjects a class of human beings, the preborn, to the life or death decision making power of the mother. Legalized abortion contradicts the expected legal application of the amendment. And um, also the, the primary framer of the 14th Amendment, Representative John Bingham, he intended it to ensure that, quote, no state in the union should deny to any human being the equal protection of the laws, end of quote. He described the amendment as a remedy to the denial of basic human rights by putting in a limitation expressly in the Constitution so that when any other state shall in its madness or its folly refuse to the gentleman, this is a quote now, refuse to the gentleman or his children or to me or to mine any of the rights which pertain to American citizenship or to common humanity, there will be redress for the wrong through the power and majesty of American law. And just a few years earlier, Bingham expressed his view that the term person as used in the Fifth Amendment included all human beings, saying natural or inherent rights which belong to all men, irrespective of all conventional regulations, are by this Constitution guaranteed by the broad and comprehensive word person as contradistinguished from the limited term citizen, in, as in the fifth article of amendments, guarding those sacred rights which are universal and indestructible as the human race. No state may rightfully by constitution or statute law impair any of these guaranteed rights, either political or natural. Finally, though Bingham never went explicitly, he never explicitly addressed the issue of abortion. The general consensus in 1868 was that prenatal life was human and therefore included within common humanity. The amendment cannot, therefore, be legitimately interpreted to exclude a group of individuals who were regarded as human beings at the time that the 14th Amendment was written case closed again as father said that we're not making the case here we're just telling you how it is this is what it was back in 1868 and this is what it is today we're mass murdering children in the womb it's unconstitutional under the 14th amendment i don't see any other possible historical reading here when it comes to the 14th amendment as laid out by the facts we just shared father yeah, imagine in 1868, this thought just popped into my head as you were reading the treatise, uh, 1868, you know, where the, the country is uh, congratulating the blacks on their freedom. But, hey, but in 150 years, we're going to be murdering half of you before you're born, right? And and it, it, it's 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 incredulous. I mean, it's it's ludicrous to think that that the people in 1868, you know, would would say, wait a second, we we went to war over this, right? To free the slaves, and now 150 years later, in the same country, 50 percent of of every black person conceived will be murdered in the United States. And folks, if that number is uh, new to you, well, that's the, that's the absolute truth. It's over 50 percent in certain states like New York, in like New York, but 50 percent of all black babies conceived in the United States are murdered before they're born. Um, this is and and then one third 
All right, one third of uh, of uh, all pregnancies, all children conceived uh, are murdered before they're born in the United States. So it, it really is it really is hard to get our minds around that this is where we were uh, at the passing of the Fourteenth Amendment, and now everyone is just absolutely ignoring it, right? Uh, and ignoring it for just, you know, reasons that are immoral too, right? Embryonic stem cell tissue research, in vitro fertilization, contraception will all be affected by these things. The possible criminalization of women uh, uh, could come about, uh, not all women, but, but some women who have abortions. But that should not be a factor, all right? This is, this is moral or immoral. This is black and white. Right. These babies are uh, have an alienable right to life endowed by our creator from the moment of conception. Uh, and they should be uh, have the equal protection under the law. And uh, yet we're mass murdering them. They're an excluded constitutional class and we're mass murdering them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, so, and since the Fifth Amendment was uh, was invoked, just real quickly, what is included within the Fifth, Fifth Amendment is the following. No person shall be deprived of life liberty or property without due process of law. And then, and then think of this, all right? So this exposes some of the games we see here politically by the Republican Party. This is the 2016 Republican Party platform. It's got a heading that says the Fifth Amendment protecting human life. And this is what it says underneath that heading. The Constitution's guarantee that no one can be, quote, deprived of life, liberty, or property deliberately echoes the Declaration of Independence's proclamation that all are endowed by their creator with the inalienable right to life. Accordingly, we assert the sanctity of human life and affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental right to life which cannot be infringed. We support a human life amendment to the Constitution and legislation to make it clear that the 14th Amendment's protections apply to children before birth. So this is what is in the uh, the actual platform in 2016. Now, this platform was carried over in 2020. They didn't do anything new. They just said, let's keep the 2016 one. The 2024 uh, Republican National Convention is going to take place in Milwaukee, uh, July, uh, mid-July. And so um, that's where the national nominating convention, uh, where they do the formal uh, ceremony, where, where uh, they officially select the nominee, but also where they adopt the party platform. So we'll see what comes of that. But there it was in the platform. And yet um, we don't hear re- really anybody talking about that. We don't see anybody really putting forth efforts to really make that happen. Father, your comments. Yeah, and they they mentioned uh, that they need a human life amendment, but they have a human life amendment, right? It's the 5th and 14th Amendments, especially the 14th Amendment. And uh, again, I want to reiterate to everyone, reinforce to everyone out there, we're not looking for legislation. We're not looking for an amendment. We need one court case, one court case, right? And that could be happening right here in Florida. Go to last week's show to check that out. We need one court case. That's what the Men's March is all about. The Men's March.com, the Men's March.com. The Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Go out into the world today, my friends, and give them heaven. All right. Pray and work. God bless you.